I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week, we are going to be looking at one of the greatest years of movies of all time. The year is 1999. This is the year of movies like Fight Club and The Matrix and Talented Miss Ripley and Being John Malkovich and Austin Powers and The Blair Witch Project and Notting Hill and The Virgin Suicides and American Pie and Election and Princess Mononoke and... There's so many more I can name, but it was really one of the greatest years uh, in movie history, yet the, all those movies that I just uh, mentioned were not nominated for Best Picture. So in this episode, we're going to try to figure out what was nominated for Best Picture, did they hold up, and which one was sort of the uh, ugly ducking, duckling that didn't really have the cultural reputation despite being released in one of the greatest movie years of all time. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is break down a movie that was nominated for Best Picture that I believe has been forgotten to time. We've been working our way back since 2011, every year, you know, one by one, and, and I always pick one movie that either I haven't seen, or I haven't seen in a long time, or I feel like just doesn't have as much cultural impact. And maybe you have remembered it, maybe you've seen it, but that doesn't mean it's not as remembered as some of the other movies. It's a little bit more forgotten. And I think The Cider House Rules, the movie we're covering today, is a classic, classic example of that. But the first part, I'm going to be talking about the 1999 Oscar year, why it was the greatest, a little bit of historical context, then my thoughts on the movie, because this was the only movie of the nominees that I hadn't seen, and then finally trying to answer that central question as to why this movie has been forgotten and not another movie. But for the 1999 Oscars, I listed all those great movies and none were nominated for Best Picture, but like I said, this is still one of the greatest years of movie history, so they had a very low percentage chance of nominating a movie that wasn't great. As a matter of fact, I think the other four movies, aside from the Cider House rules, are still very well um, remembered. Uh, despite what you know, film Twitter or certain critics may have you believe, movies like American Beauty and The Green Mile are very well loved and appreciated. They're very highly ranked on IMDb, which is a user-generated score. So in terms of audiences, this is still movies that people watch and rewatch and go back to. American Beauty is ranked at 80 as one of the greatest movies of all time in terms of that list and uh, the green mile is 29 which is actually the highest movie we've ever talked about on this show in terms of imdb ranking so you know i could have gone with something like the green mile because i'm not sure if everybody's seen it but i do think that there's sort of a strong cohort of people who do who have seen that movie and have loved it and it's got over you know a million reviews on imdb so i think that's a good judge to say that those two movies are still really well liked and, and well appreciated. Um, then you have The Sixth Sense, which was also nominated, which was a huge blockbuster at the time. Of course, it's been connected to M. Night Shyamalan being his first sort of breakout movie and his most recent movie, Old, has just been released in theaters. So that has to, you know, give a little bit of a boost that this guy who made The Sixth Sense is still making original thrillers and people are still going to go to them. And, you know, some are blockbusters essentially. And if you haven't seen the movie, it's a great twist movie, so you want to sort of show that to people or rewatch it to see where, you know, certain uh, scenes happen and you didn't realize it the first time. Um, so there's a lot of fun that way too. And then the fourth movie is The Insider, which is maybe not Michael Mann's best movie, but it's still connected to Michael Mann, the director of Heat, of The Last of, Mo of the Mohicans, of Collateral, who's a ve very well appreciated and well regarded sort of auteur director. So when going back through his filmography, which isn't that long, I think people will go back and watch, you know, The Insider, Insider which I think is sort of an underrated movie, even within Michael Mann's filmography. I mean, maybe Russell Crowe's best performance, but she knows incredible in it. It really is sort of is a great, it was supposed to be Michael man sort of big Oscar movie and it didn't pan out to be that way um, but it really is sort of a, a almost an underrated gem because it's not collateral it's it's not he it's something a little bit different and then we have the cider house rules which I think is in a different class than some of those other movies I think some people talk about the green mile or American beauty more than they talk about the cider house rules and I always thought of it like that it was for the ugly duckling of the Oscars and I know last week I covered a Lassie Hallstrom movie and I usually don't like to cover the same director twice but I do try to I did think that the cider house rules was a great kind of moment in this 99 history because I could have gone with something like The Insider because I do think it's an underrated Michael Mann movie, but The Cider House Rules really fits into our definition to a T in the sense that this is one of the greatest movie years of all time, yet this movie not only was nominated, but it was actually a big thing. So why was it a big thing in the 90, in 99, but has sort of for, been more forgotten over time? Trying to answer that question is the sort of thesis of this show. 
But this really was a big deal at the time. I mean, not only did it get nominated for Best Picture and for Best Director, it won for Best Screenplay and it won for Best Supporting Actor for Michael Caine. So this was a well-appreciated movie even at the time. You know, some other movies that we've covered that have been sort of forgotten, movies like Sea Biscuit or In the Bedroom, they get a bunch of nominations, but then they actually don't end up winning anything. So there's a little bit of a reason as to, oh, I'm just happy it got nominated at the time and so on and so forth. But this one, you know, not only did it, was it happy to get nominated, it was a serious contender in the sense that it was nominated for director and won for screenplay and acting. And in particular, that acting win for supporting actor for Michael Caine is one of the strangest and hard to explain sort of confounding Oscar wins, I think, in history. Because on first glance, you go, oh, it's Michael Caine. He was 67 at the time. Okay, it was sort of a career achievement award. That happens at the Oscars, but maybe, you know, it makes sense. But that's not the case, actually. Um, because this is Michael Caine's second Oscar. He won a decade prior to, for Hannah and Her Sisters. So you can't use the excuse that, oh, it was a career achievement. I mean, this was a second, you know, award for him. So that just indicates that, you know, that they really liked Michael Caine and they really liked this performance. They thought it was the best of the year. Now you may go, okay, well, maybe it was a weak competition. So that makes sense, right? Well, not necessarily. If you look at the four other nominees, Haley Joel Osman, The Sixth Sense, Michael Clark Duncan, The Green Mile, Jude Law, Talented Mr. Ripley, and Tom Cruise for Magnolia. In my personal preference, I'd probably give it to the one of any of those four great actors. And even more so, what's strange is that not only was it a strong competitive year, I think you could argue that out of those four great actors, each of those roles are their signature performance. I mean, when I think of the talented Mr. Ripley, I think of Jude Law and, and vice versa. When I think of Haley Joel Osment, I think of The Sixth Sense. So these are not only great performance from, performances from these actors, arguably one of their most iconic performances. And yet Michael Caine's for the Cider House Rules, it's not a bad performance. I enjoyed the movie. He's my favorite part of the movie. But it is weird in the sense that it's not even, I would say, a top four Michael Caine performance. It's not as recognizable as something like, you know, when you think of, you know, Michael Clark Duncan, you think of The Green Mile in many respects. Those are the sort of best performances, and yet none of them won. So all this means is that this was a thing, that this wasn't forgotten at the time. It was celebrated at the time. It was well appreciated and well beloved at the time. So what happened? What happened that sort of devolved into, you know, why it was forgotten? But first, uh, transitioning now into my thoughts, I like movies that feel like books. That is, movies that feel like you're reading a great book. You know the feeling when you're reading a great book at the end, you sort of are hanging on to every word and you don't want to end because you've gone on a journey with these people. I think there's also sort of movies that are able to do that within the cinematic medium in a short period of time. Of course, The Lord of the Rings comes to mind. I think Badlands has sort of a great uh, sort of narration, omniscient kind of a perspective. Barry Lyndon, of course, based on a book, but has that similar uh, idea. I think Little Children is similar in that way. Uh, they do feel almost very book-like, but they lean heavily into that. I think the best parts of this movie do what those movies are able to do so well. Sort of take down and boil down the essence of the book into these small moments and these small scenes and to really understand the relationships and really develop the relationships that, you know, in, a, in all book uh, to movie adaptations have this challenge of like, you have this book, which is, you know, if we were to make it every uh, your chapter into a TV series episode, it'd be fine, but you have to make a six hour movie. But if you're making a two hour movie, two and a half hour movie, you have to cut certain things and you have to sort of boil down certain relationships into smaller scenes to convey the larger essence. And choosing what to include and what to cut is just as key as what you kept. Uh, and in this movie, I think the stuff with the orphanage is really great. This is where Michael Caine comes in, where we start the movie um, and, and really get to know the characters. I love all the sort of kids at the orphanage. I understand how everything works. I understand um, Homer, which is Tobey Maguire's character, his place within the, the story uh, and his sort of father-son-esque relationship with Michael Caine. Of course, the topic of abortion comes up, which I felt was sort of tastefully handled within the movie, sort of the debate between back and forth between the characters. But in this a short period of time, I really feel that Lassie Hallstrom is able to adapt it and John Irving, who adapted his own novel, really able to boil down in these small scenes, of course, aided by Tobey Maguire and Michael Caine's acting. So much so that Michael Caine actually really looms over the rest of the movie because of how sort of great these the, that first part is, because of how 
the dynamic is so clear, how the, the orphanage is laid out is very clear. You feel like, oh, this is Homer's home, that this is where he's from. So that when the second part happens and he actually leaves from the home, well, I do think is it makes sense as a structural narrative. I mean, he has to sort of go out and experience the world before you know he decides if he wants to come back home and sort of the experiences that he has being sort of more of a sheltered existence now going out more into the real world and facing war and all, all different types of you know, more issues. It does make sense on a structural level. I do find that in the sort of condensed moments of the orphanage, I really understood everybody and their motivations and I felt a connection to that place. But when we left, Maybe in in part due to the, the, the strength of the filmmaking, it could say, but it didn't feel as compelling. I felt that the second part, and there's large swaths of the movie that feel lagging, that the maybe will introduce a topic like incest or whatever, but then sort of uh, breeze over it really quickly because there's not enough time to deal with it. Um, the relationship between Tobey Maguire Homer and, and Charlize Theron's character isn't totally developed. I mean, they do have scenes together that are charming and sweet, but they kind of just don't go anywhere. There's not a, a, a natural ending point. They feel a little bit abrupt at certain scenarios, just because I'm not sure if that chemistry is 100% there. There are good stuff about the sort of second half um, with Delroy Lindo's character, who I think does a great job here. Even Paul Rudd is charming in his few scenes, but it does lag, particularly to the first part, so the orphanage part, and it definitely that part looms over, and I'm kind of just waiting for Homer to go back to the orphanage because the stuff that's going on isn't as interesting, and the topics that introduced aren't necessarily allowed to uh, breathe as much as the first part does, so they feel a little bit rushed and feel a little bit inconsistent and unnecessary. So it's a little bit of a movie, a tale of two halves, where the stuff that's really good is really good, and the stuff that's not as good lags and feels a little bit boring. But why was this movie forgotten? You know, it's not a terrible movie. It's not atrocious. I mean, I would watch it again. I did have a, ultimately a good time watching it because of that, that first half. Um, I went nominated over something like Fight Club or The Matrix or something. But I understand why it was nominated. But the more interesting question, I think, is like, you know, why wasn't this as well remembered? I could see people who like this the same way they like The Green Mile. But I, what I think we've talked about in many scenarios is like, to be remembered, you have to be able to have a movie that's easily rewatchable, or have a movie that's connected to an auteur director, or have some sort of historical context to it. But what one, what's one thing that I think we haven't talked about, which I think is integral, particularly for this movie, is availability. That when you think of all the streaming options, you go, oh man, you know, people must be so lucky, they can watch any movie whenever they want at any time. And while that's true for a lot of things, you know, Netflix, for example, is a platform that doesn't have a lot of older movies, particularly, you know, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, those movies are still very hard to find. But then for a movie like this, The Cider House Rules, Best Picture nominee, won a couple of Oscars, you'd think it'd be more available than it is. I mean, it's not available on Netflix in any country that I'm aware of. It wasn't available on HBO Max or the Canadian equivalent Crave. Um, it wasn't available on Prime Video as a part of the subscription nor was it even available to rent on Prime Video in many countries. The only place I could find it is on iTunes, on Apple TV. So it's a strange for a movie like this, you know, when we see a movie like American Beauty or The Green Mile or The Fight Club or The Matrix, I mean, these movies are all on Netflix and on a lot of countries' Netflix. And if they're not on Netflix, Prime has bought it up. You know, because so there's a certain element to a lot of people, how they watch movies is they open up Netflix and whatever sort of feature to them, they give a, a serious consideration and oftentimes, oh, that sounds pretty good and they'll watch it. Uh, you know, that's why a movie like Spencer Confidential is, you know, got like 100 million people to watch it. Now, sometimes that doesn't mean watching doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be well remembered. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, sure, I'm not sure how many people still talk about Spencer Confidential and love that movie and put it at the top 10 of the year. But a lot of people watched it, enjoyed it, and maybe forgot about it. So watching and eyeballs isn't everything. But it does help for a movie that is good to have eyeballs. And I think there's a lot of great movies that have been forgotten just because they're really hard to see. And if they're really hard to see, I mean, you can only rent them on one platform kind of level, or you can't even rent them at all. Well, how do you expect people to see it? How do you expect people to rediscover the movie and share it with people? I do think that there is a sort of a, a group of uh, people who love this movie, but they are sort of people that maybe watched in the 90s and maybe have a DVD, but that's it. I don't feel that there's a new generation, in part because of that availability, which is a crucial element that we haven't talked about really in this season, but I think The Sire House Rules is a clear example of why a movie like this is just not as well appreciated and well celebrated because I'm not sure how many people still watch it.
because it's not available on some of these streaming services, which is how most people watch movies nowadays. And then, like I mentioned, you know, last week with Lassie Hosh Hoshroom, you know, the shock a lot. I mean, he's gone on to be more of a Hollywood hand for hire doing the Nutcracker in the Four Realms and Dog's Purpose and leaning into that sort of sentimentality element. And he's kind of that guy. If you want to go to some, a movie like The Dog's Purpose, you get Lassie Hallstrom versus someone like M. Night Shyamalan or Michael Mann, who have sort of risen into sort of film criticism, uh, legendary status and have sort of, you know, you know, the title, you know, from the mastermind, M. Night Shyamalan. People don't have that with Lassie Hallstrom, so maybe that's another reason why people aren't necessarily huge Lassie Hallstrom fans, that they'll have to go back and watch his movies. So th that, that's a factor you have to consider too. But in my opinion, one of the sort of strangest and, and maybe most forgotten best picture movies, because it's such a great year with so many great movies, and all the other nominees, I think, are also great movies that are well-remembered. And then there's the Cider House Rules. I mean, it is sort of the definition of the series, why I wanted to do the series because we get movies like this that ultimately do get forgotten and lost to time. And there's a few reasons why, but maybe it's quality, maybe it's availability, maybe it's a mix of both. I lean more so on the availability side, but even, you know, chronicling Michael Caine's sort of weird win. This was a really fun Oscar year, and uh, I hope you enjoyed sort of reviewing it with me. So comment below, let me know your thoughts on the Cider House Rules. If you've seen it, there's a lot of great movies from 1999. Comment below, maybe let me know your favorite year top 10 of 1999. I love to hear that. Um, but that's about it, guys. Until next time, stay tuned.